Mordred. Father. It's time to end it all. Well, we agree on that at least. You know, Father, if you'd lived, I don't think we'd have been very happy as a family. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to We Read This. My name's Ash and today I'm going to be looking at the alliterative Mort Arthur. This is a long poem dating back from around 1400 that tells the story of the legendary King of Britons leading an army to Europe and forcing Rome to kneel before him. And so he does, making good on a prophecy of Merlin's found in Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain, namely that Arthur would make the house of Romulus tremble at his savagery. But in the poem, following his victory on the continent, Arthur returns home to confront his doom in the form of his treacherous nephew, Mordred. Now we glimpsed Arthur briefly in our episode on the prophecies of Merlin, but today marks the first of several episodes that will concentrate on Arthur and the literature he inspired. It's also our first proper tilt into medieval literature and our first episode on a poem of this length. And so for all those reasons, I'm very grateful to be joined today by Michael Smith, who has produced a new version of the alliterative Mort Arthur. Michael is a translator and printmaker who has previously published a version of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, a poem that I hope to be talking about soon on the podcast, and one that crops up several times in the course of today's conversation. Both Michael's Gawain and his alliterative Arthur are illustrated with his beautiful lino-cut prints, which you can hear more about in tomorrow's episode, where I'm going to ask him more about his work. In the meantime, you can see and purchase Michael's prints and signed copies of Gawain and the Green Knight at his website, mythicalbritain.co.uk. You also have four more days to pledge a donation towards the publication of the alliterative Arthur, for which you can receive a personalised copy and have your name acknowledged in the book. I'll leave a link in the description to Michael's site, and in the meantime, I hope you enjoy the episode. What sort of details can we glean about the poet, um, even if we don't know who exactly they are? Okay, well, I mean, the first thing to say is that um, the manuscript itself is a transcription by Robert Thornton Mm. of an earlier manuscript. And that manuscript, the author of it is, as you say, unknown. Um, However, uh, the the dialect of it is thought to originate in Lincolnshire uh, and possibly quite close to Henry IV's uh, castle at Bolingbroke in the mm. south of the county. Now, I, I, I say that slightly mischievously because to try and create a connection with Henry Bolingbroke, but there, pro- there is probably none whatsoever. Uh, um, however, there are themes which run through the manuscripts which uh, potentially relate to a support for Bolingbroke um, at the time of um, his usurping of the crown from Richard II. There are several ways of reading this poem uh, and trying to analyze the information within it, which allows us to come to some form of date. Uh, but it's it's depending on how you interrogate the poem, it places it somewhere between 1350 and 1402, and more precisely, probably between 1375 and 1402. And if you really want to boil it down, between 1399 and 1402 which (laughs) but um all of these things are a bit well it's possible to follow them through but at some point you have to give up uh to Mm. try and find out who it was that was writing this but clearly somebody who was um people say that shouldn't really try and define a medieval person by today's standards but you would probably call them uh belonging to or trying to appeal to anyway, the upper middle classes, uh, the lower gentry, perhaps. What what I'm never sure about is who came up with the idea and who the scribe was. I mean, Mm. these are two different people. Did the scribe make up the poem himself? Did he compile it from a number of sources and then was his own poet? Or was there some poetic uh, uh, semi-aristocrat who was walking around a chamber in some monastery somewhere saying, get this down, right, Mm. I've got it now, and we're going to do this. Uh, So that's not clear. But I think if we just talk about it in the round, I think we're dealing with uh, a level of society, let's say a sort of lower gentry or uh, 
um, well, what we might call lower aristocracy today, the sort of people you never see in the news, but who are the thin vein of uh, what I like to think about. Uh, if you think about a steak and it has those bits of gristle in it, mm. those are the aristocrats that hold Britain together today that you never hear about, but have an enormous amount of influence. And uh, so these writers, I think, were serving those people and may have come from that class. Got you right. What I'd read about alliterative verse, and maybe maybe this is an- anachronistic to say um, of this period, because obviously it's been a- burning around for a long time, was that it was thought to be popular amongst the sort of lower classes, and yet there's a- immediately a-, a kind of scholarly uh, whiff about, about <laughs> the poem. Um, I mean, from the very first uh, line, I, I, it sort of sounds a bit like the opening of Metamorphoses. There's a kind of invocation to for, for, for help with my the, the writing of my poem sort of thing. So yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, but um, lower classes, interesting. Uh, oh, I mean, you're touching on quite a, a, a multi-level discussion here. Mm. Um, now. Uh, there is this thing called the alliterative revival of the 14th century, and that's when all this alliterative poet, poetry appears. Or should we say it appears in writing? What we don't know is whether it ever disappeared uh, between the yeah. sort of Saxon period and the 14th century. But we do know that there's a, quite a bit of it around in the 14th century. And also it is what we would call today provincial uh, which is to say largely began in the sort of uh, the West West country, west of England, mm-hmm. uh, Gloucestershire around there, and then moved up into uh, two major dialects of the North, the uh, West Midlands and the East Midlands dialects, and then eventually migrated up into the Scottish and Northumbrian uh, dialects there. Uh, Chaucer, with his London uh, dialect, uh, was dismissive in the Canterbury Tales of uh, the alliterative poets. And he, he talks, I can't remember which one it is now, the, the Miller's Tale, I can't remember. But I think it's he, the parson, only because I was reading your own introduction oh, <laughs> to okay. Gawain. Oh, it's late in the day. I, I have forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you taught I, me that. <laughs> I did I? Oh, well, yeah. well, it's sunk in someone's head, if not my own. Yeah. Um, but uh, he says he, he does not speak rum ram rough by letter. Yeah. Uh, and he's basically making fun of these uh, semi-illiterate Northern poets, but they weren't semi-illiterate. And mm. the, the point about these dialects is that um, there was no central English or British control at that time. Uh, control was held in local uh, courts. If we think about the Duchy of Lancaster, the Palatinates of Chester, uh, great earldoms, and each had huge uh, political, held huge political sway. And consequently, they attracted courts of their own. I mean, if you think of someone like John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster, this man ran the kingdom during Mm. the uh, early years of the reign of Richard II. So this wasn't some sort of Northern hick. He was uh, a very intelligent man. So consequently, the people, these the poets that were trying to influence these people worked at a very high level. And, Mm. and, And you know, you only need to look at Sir Gawain and the Green Knight to see whoever wrote that had a profound understanding of politics, behavior, nuance, religion. I mean, he, he was an incredibly well and well read and skillful person in putting that together. I mean, it still stands today as a, a magisterial work of English literature. John of Gaunt's brother in law was the poet Geoffrey Chaucer. Chaucer was born in the 1340s and at an early age entered the court of Edward III. Chaucer would go on to be associated with the standardising of the English language and its eventual dominance over all others as the national tongue. But following the custom of the court, his first verses were written in French. This was because English poets born in the 14th century were brought up in a polyglot society. According to Michael Schmidt, they would have known that the language of learning was Latin, the language of power and business was Norman French, and that their English was a poor cousin. Not only poor, it was a confusing and changeable cousin. In the 14th century, if two Englishmen from opposite ends of the country were to converse, they would be better off doing so in French rather than attempting to penetrate each other's bafflingly foreign dialect. And though eventually, as the language was standardised, the southern English of Chaucer would win out, For some time beforehand, it was the North that could boast of the most poets writing in English, 
This was partially due to them being further away from the Norman sphere of influence, but it was also encouraged in later years by both Edward III and his father, Edward II, who moved their governments to York to keep a close eye on those pilfering borderers, the Scots. Brian Stone suggests the author could have been close to the court of Edward III, so perhaps they were able to gain entry thanks to this royal relocation to the north. Edward III was in many ways an ideal monarch for an English poet, having championed the language in a fit of anti-French feeling. Before he came to the throne, reading in English was, in Schmidt's words, a furtive activity frowned on by authority. Now the poets were free to develop their language, codify it in print, and crucially, openly read in English. Um, so, so with uh, this poet, what uh, sort of sources were um, they working working from? Yeah, uh, a whole raft of them. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so there are two strands in uh, Arthurian writing. Uh, there is that strand which comes from Geoffrey of Monmouth, uh, who created the um, history of the kings of Britain in 1136. Uh and then there is the Romantic Strand, which comes not, a, not exclusively, but from Chrétien de Troyes in France, who was writing later. Uh, and the Geoffrey of Monmouth Strand is known as the Galfridian Strand. And it it's, reads more like a chronicle uh, rather than a romance. So it talks about, Geoffrey of Monmouth talks about a whole series of British kings of which Arthur is just one and it talks about his rise and his fall. And we're not here reading about uh, damsels in distress and uh, things like this and the magic of Merlin. Well, there's a little bit of that, but it, it, it's not over romanticized. It's, it's very much almost a political or semi-political history with a bit of flavor thrown in. And so the alliterative Mort Arthur falls in that strand. So when you read it, you'll see Merlin doesn't feature at all in the mm. story. Some of the major characters that people will be familiar with, like Lancelot, are actually quite minor in this story, whereas uh, Sir Cador, Sir Cador of Cornwall, is a, is a significant figure. Uh, Arthur is significant. Gawain is significant. Uh, but all the other characters, or Mordred, but the other characters, Guinevere is a bit part, um, mm. Uh, although unusually in this version of the story, she ends up uh, having children by Mordred, which is a unique to the to this particular telling. Oh, right. uh, so, so yeah, so so this version takes as its so to answer your question, it, it draws on the Galfridian strand. Uh, so Geoffrey of Monmouth, Wace, Lyamon, uh, so th these sorts of people. Mm. And on to, uh, in terms of its readership, on uh, kind of on which side of the coin. Um, would it have f fallen in terms of being read as a chronicle or a history or being read as a romance? Yeah, that's a good question because although it's in, in the Galfridian uh, strain, it's clearly designed to be read aloud. Uh, mm. It is full of bloodshed, gore, uh, <laughs> brutality, but it's also about the fall of kings. Uh, and it deals with this Middle English, uh, well, the, what the illiterate poets called circuadry, uh, um, uh, an overweening pride. And mm -hmm. Arthur sub becomes obsessed with himself in the end and is brought down by his pride. So it tells a tale based on the Galfridian chronicle approach. But it, like many of these poems, it's written to infer best behavior. So it tells its listeners or its readers not to become obsessed with pride, to have a religious sense, a sense of care for others. Um, I mean, Arthur overreaches himself significantly by ventures abroad. He wants to become a Holy Roman Emperor almost. He's, he's made that by, uh, or almost made it by his attack on Rome at the end. He, he makes the Pope bow to him, which in those days, of course, you know, if you're claiming you're above the Pope, mm. then your pride really had gone uh, beyond the pale. So, so, it's, so, it, so it tells a tale, but it tells a tale for a reason. And like most of these poems, it's about instruction, not didactically so, because to do so might risk the life of the poet, but, uh, but rather like a court jester, you know, you make fun of your audience uh, in the same way these poets are drawing the, the landed people in uh, mm. and trying to show them the error of their ways by careful uh, 
illumination of the errors of others. Hmm. Well, I, my next question was going to be, uh, I was going to ask you about its relationship with the, the Arthurian text that came afterwards, the, the Stanzaic Arthur and, and of, of course, Mallory's. Um, you, I mean, you've, I think you've somewhat answered it in, in that it's got an s- element of moral instruction, whereas Mallory seems to perhaps be most useful for, for uh, specifically law, laws of chivalry, <laughs> um, as opposed to, yeah, you know, for, for people who aren't knights who are soaking the earth with gore. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, again, uh, um, hmm, okay. The, the, the Elixir of Mortarth was written at the time of, uh, I mean, the, of the sort of apogee of the age of chivalry, mm. if you like, or, the, sort of the, or its rebirth under Edward III. Uh, of course, its apogee was a century or so earlier, but uh, under Edward III, you had the forming of the Order of the Garter and other orders uh, elsewhere in France and so on. And uh, Geoffrey, de, Geoffrey de Charny, whose uh, Livre de Chivalry, or was it the Book of Chivalry, or whatever it is, uh, he wrote this uh, treatise on how knights should behave and what they should expect. And a lot of this is... Um, dealt with a little a little in uh, the Elisha Mort Arthur by showing chivalry for what it is, which is a completely bogus fraud. Uh, it's, uh, it shows that these, it, it talks about these gallant men and their panoply. And then the next breath, it says they nobly slice through their heads or a piece of liver ends up on someone's lance or, yeah. you know, or the bow, someone's face, someone's bowels get trodden into the earth by a horse. Uh, and at one point, King Arthur cuts a man in half, and the and the, narr- the narrator says, uh, "My hope, true to say, is his wound never heals." You know, it's that, not that it ever would in that situation, but so he's lampooning chivalry as well, and he's saying to mm. his uh, audience, "You know, chivalry is it, it, is not it. You know, it's 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 a it, it disguises the real horror and bloodshed of warfare." You could argue that there's a, a religious, well, there is a religious element to this poem in that way. Um, mm. Now, yeah, so um, as you say, um, Mallory and also the Stanzaic Arthur, they're in it, they're, I would place both of them more on the romantic side of uh, the Arthurian canon, although uh, Mallory does, of course, draw from both. Uh, the Elixir mm. and the Stanzaic Mort Arthur in creations of parts of his story. And it is thought that the alliterative style uh, play uh, in the alliterative Arthur uh, played a, a, a significant role in the development of, of Mallory's style as well. Oh, right. Uh, I believe. Uh, but I mean, I think with the alliterative Mort Arthur, you can read a lot into it on a number of angles and that's it. That's its beauty. I think it actually does have a didactic, message um i mean it reads almost like how it, it, it it's like a desanitized version of the films of world war one mm. if you think of those films that audiences at home must have been seen of the brave boys going over the top and then you have poems written by sassoon and the like saying this is just crap uh this is what the mort arthur is saying he's saying you know don't, don't believe all you read in the papers this is what's really going on you know, yeah. so there's that's coming through as well that's so interesting. So you mentioned that had the poem been a bit too didactic, the poet would very likely be in trouble. Was, yes. Were they not um, equally risk at risk for if they were seen to be lampooning the chivalry that was quite seriously um, being adopted by Edward III and so on? It's a, good, it's a good point. I suppose they're trying to please their patron, whoever their patron was. Because mm. um, these poets... I mean, we don't know who they were, but most likely they weren't paid. Instead, they were re- rewarded um, by some kind of stipend. Either they could live in court or they ha- they were an official poet to uh, a, a household or whatever it was, and they were given a room in the house. So if they were pleasing their particular patron, um, then they were probably okay. But if they then subsequently failed to please, uh, they might find themselves mopping out the stables all kicked out altogether. As we saw on our episode on Edward II, feelings of chivalric brotherhood often went hand in hand with holding hands. To this day, it can be difficult for the historian studying this age of chivalry to distinguish between homosexual relationships and excesses of brotherly passion. At the time of writing the poem, the disastrous consequences of the oath of brotherhood between Edward II and Pierce Gaveston 
would be well within living memory. Gaveston's ghost would be recalled in the latter part of the 14th century with the similar rise of one of Richard II's favourites, Robert de Vere. Like Gaveston, he was adored by the king and loathed by the nobility. After his favourite died in exile, Richard had his body shipped to England and reburied three years after de Vere's death. During the ceremony, he ordered the coffin opened so he could, for one last time, look upon his friend and touch his fingers. Richard was also known to dish out knighthoods a little too liberally, something we see King Arthur doing during this poem. In a sequence of four English kings, we see an alternating pattern with regards to chivalry. Both Edward I and his grandson, Edward III, had a keen interest in King Arthur and deliberately evoked his spirit in their courts, Edward III going as far as recreating the round table. Between them came Edward II and after them Richard II. Both are characterised as militaristically weak and prone to forming dangerously close friendships with male favourites. They are also both betrayed by their subjects, who formed coalitional and usurping groups. Edward II when the nobility forced him to banish Gaveston, and Richard II by the Lord's Appellant, who objected to five of Richard's favourites and successfully had a number of them purged during the merciless Parliament of 1388. If our poets had indeed been at the court of Edward III, they could have seen close up the ways in which chivalric codes of honour were ripe for manipulation, and the conclusion of his poem shows how King Arthur's reliance on unquestionable loyalty has left him with a Mordred-shaped blind spot. In Arthur's absence, Mordred has seized the throne and claimed the king's wife, Guinevere. This is only slightly less incestuous than it usually is, Mordred in this version being King Arthur's nephew and not his son. After Gawain is killed by Mordred, Arthur vows vengeance in terms that anticipate the destruction to follow. I shall never rest easy or have peace of heart in any city or suburb set upon earth. Never slumber nor sleep though my eyes sink in weariness till he is killed who killed Gawain if my craft prevail, but shall ever hunt down the heathen who hurt my people until I pen them and imprison them where I please. But Arthur is not a wandering knight-errant hunting down the man who wronged him, but the leader of a nation and it is this dangerous infiltration of chivalric code into the business of kingship that leads not just to the mort Arthur, but the mort of many of his men. According to Marco Nievergelt, the poem is, ideologically speaking, suspended between admiration of chivalric culture and the sobering awareness of its brutal and tragic consequences, its disastrous political outcome and its burdening of the non-military classes. By the end of the poem, Arthur is surrounded by corpses of friends, the result of a shambolic and bitter battle in which he killed his nephew and received his own death blow. According to Christine Kism, the poem climaxes in Arthur's devastating realisation that he has become either a woeful widow, shorn at once of masculinity, love and future issue, or a forlorn pilgrim, affixed to and gorily dripping with the blood-made relic of his dead nephew, or a grim, child-destroying tyrant. We're talking about mocking chivalry, which is something um, you think of in terms of uh, Don Quixote centuries later, <laughs> you know, here it is, here it is. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, that's, that's how I read it. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, it's so, uh, I mean, you, okay. It could be argued that many uh, literature poets develop this, describe brutal things going on. Uh, the siege of Jerusalem, for example, which I've, which I've not read in its entirety, uh, but it, it is incredibly brutal and is, is anti-Semitic in places. I think that these are really harsh poems, uh, incredibly vile things in, in places. Um, and uh, so you could argue that the literature of Arthur actually isn't what I've just said. It's just part of a trend of violent stories. Uh, and if you and if you interpret it that way, then you might think the poems are written for a load of bloodthirsty knights sitting around a, a bawdy table somewhere in Lancashire, having a great time. Tell us about the time someone had his head cut off, his <laughs> gorse, you know, all that. So it could be that, you know, it could well be. You could read it as that if you wanted to. But I think there are so many levels going on with this poem. And as we saw, as you said at the beginning, that it opens with this invocation. It's a religious invocation. And he talks about God helping us to live a better life. Um, and, and, you know, the, and, and religion runs through the story. So uh, Sir Kay, when he's killed, he's killed unchival unchivalrously. He's, he's stabbed in the back or lands through the back. Uh, and then, but before he dies, he must kneel and pray and give up his soul to God. So these, these elements are still there uh, because, 
that's what people did in that time. So it wasn't some kind of Ben Elton uh, group of people going around taking the piss out of everybody. Yeah. It wasn't quite that. But I think there's a that uh, there's a that there is a flavour of reform in these works, which which I find really appealing. And how much that is really coming out, and how much I'm saying it's so, is I, I'm not entirely sure, but. Um, but that's how I read these poems. No, that, I think that's very convincing, especially since you mentioned Sassoon in particular, um, and the, the 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 inner inner conflict of of you know not hardly a pacifist, and yet yeah, um, yes. also witnessing how horrible uh, yes. something worth doing is. That that seems yes. to be very much in in keeping with the because I mean a poem like this wouldn't be able to sustain itself if it was just burlesque because it, it's it would it would kind of collapse i think if it you know i think I, I think that's right i mean and the thing is if you did read it as burlesque you'd then find and when i first started work on it i thought oh god you know what is this it's, it's quite it's hard work and it, it's not really rewarding but then as you start to unpick things the themes that go through uh the holy roman empire the papal schism uh richard the second henry the fourth Wycliffe, John Wycliffe, uh, the writing of the Bible in English, Wycliffe anti-war uh, messages that are coming through. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's just a layer upon layer of fascinating stuff. Who, whoever wrote this was not some dilettante. He was he was he knew what he was doing. Yeah. And if if he was indeed uh, dressing it all up as a burlesque, well, that's a very clever thing to do. Um, and so he maybe he was appealing to his then audience, but writing for us in the future. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> well, it, um, I, I completely agree with you in terms of uh, uh, how it reads. You you do go from um, not thinking it was it's it's burlesque at all to thinking that there's a standout almost comedy bit there. Um, yes, I was thinking yeah. in particular of the. Uh, I mean, obviously, it must differ from translation to translation, and I haven't um, read yours yet. But the one I had had, um, it, it is Sir Kay, and, and when he's 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 received his death blow, and he goes to, he rides up to King Arthur and tells him quite calmly that he's received his death blow and he's not long for the world, and will he uh, pass on his respects to Queen Guinevere and all her yes. ladies, and then as an afterthought says, and also my wife who's never annoyed me. <laughs> <laughs> like, sh surely in any century that's a that's a gag. <laughs> Yeah, and it's full of those. It's yeah. absolutely full of, and the 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 joy in the translation. I mean, the way I the way I translate it is, um, I try to follow the, exactly the alliterative emphasis uh, created, but that the poet uses. So if he uses the letter C, I use the letter C, and so on. Oh, okay. Which where we're like, I have to have several lines because this poet sometimes he has, so it tends to follow the standard alliterative method of what was it A A. AAAB, which is two stresses in the first half of the, of the line and one stress in the second. But sometimes it will change to the AAAA -A -A or ABAB. -A -B. Uh, so it, it, there's no consistency to this poem. But the interesting thing about him is that sometimes he'll do this, he'll alliterate on the same letter or sound over, in some cases, seven or eight lines. And I tell you what, that doesn't half stretch you if you're trying to trying to make that work in modern English mm. and, and can repeat that. But what the outcome of that translation process is, um, is that it makes the finished translation much more authentic. And you find yourself twisting the sentence and it creates drops and pithiness, which seem to replicate the um, that's exactly the sort of comment you've you raised there about Sakai. And, uh, it, and, you know, you get this rolling piece of action and it just ends and, they all, and, and then they all went away, you know, or, or whatever it might be. Yeah. You know? and, it, and it's great. It's, it, it's, it's like a really crap punchline. And then you move on to the next, um, the next section. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's, it's a joyous thing to uncover. Um, you do it accidentally and then it just jumps out at you at the end. Yeah. Um, can I circle back to Robert Thornton for a sec? Um, yes. And ask what... so. Am I right in thinking he he came into the picture sometime in the fourteen forties? That's correct. Yes. So yes. What what yes. can we again? I'm asking you to probably recount a lot of inferment because these people are so distant. But what can we expect he might have altered or added, or and what sort of language differences might there have been between 
his transcription and the original? Yeah, okay, good questions. Uh, so Thornton, Thornton was, uh, was it East Newton near York. Uh, so how many miles is that from Southern Lincolnshire? I don't know, 50, 60 miles, something like that. Mm. So, but they would both be speaking the East Midlands dialect, more or less. Uh, um, now, uh, but of course, as you know, Yorkshire dialect is different to Lincolnshire dialect. Lincolnshire is more close to uh, Nottinghamshire. If you, list, if you go and visit those two counties, you'll, mm. you'll find that blend. But as you head north, you get more of that sort of thicker uh, Yorkshire, which comes across. So now, so how Thornton, as a Yorkshireman, interpreted Lincolnshire words, um, it's hard to say, really. But what we know that he did was an example of his technique was to take make it more obvious within the te- the transcription who was speaking and when so the original which we don't have may have been a kind of constant stream whereas he would have made breaks so that if lancelot says something or whatever it's more obvious that that these things are happening alliterative verse such as this uses alliteration to indicate the meter of the line as opposed to rhyme or having a fixed number of stresses which is what we call accentual verse Of the 30,000 or so lines that survive of Anglo-Saxon verse, the majority of it is alliterative. The poet who wrote Sir Gawain and the Green Knight acknowledged the form's history by saying, If you will listen to the lay for a little while, I shall tell it quickly as I heard it in town, as it is clearly established in firm, strong story, linked together with loyal letters, as has long been done in this land. In medieval alliterative verse, the lines tend to have four stresses, and in the version I'm reading from, three or four alliterations. Incidentally, I'm not reading from Mike's copy because it's not out yet. I'm reading from a translation by Brian Stone. So here's an example of the number of alliterations per line changing and the way in which those alliterations indicate the rhythm. We have the first to follow my furious charge and also the flower of his followers shall be fatally felled. Now the line itself is broken by a caesura in the middle, which leads to this kind of seesaw in the line. Let his highly bred beast browse on the flowers drew off his helmet and fine armour, leant on his large shield and inclined to the ground. In the bold man's whole body, no blood was left. These half-lines, or hemisticks, mean that even when the alliteration isn't very distinct, like in that second line, drew off his helmet and fine armour, you still have a sense of rocking back and forth, of turning from one hand to another. And a reason a line like that might not be too distinct is because it alliterates on the vowels, And while with consonant alliterations they'd stick to the same letter, like the flower of his followers shall be fatally filled, when it came to vowels it seemed fair game to alliterate any of them. You could also throw in an H, so the closest thing I can find to three words alliterating there is drew off his helmet and fine armour, which being an O, an H and an A doesn't sound alliterative at all. Brian Stone writes that in Anglo-Saxon the number of unstressed syllables between stresses tended to be one or two which was possible because Anglo-Saxon was an inflected language in which auxiliary words such as prepositions were sparse, and word order was to some extent flexible. But by the end of the 14th century, when this poem was composed, many inflections had disappeared or weakened, so that more prepositions and connectives were required, and accordingly it was generally necessary for a poet to include more unstressed syllables. Of course, this all just typifies alliterative verse, and, but saying such rules are at all times obeyed is like saying Shakespeare wrote everything in iambic pentameter. We refer to this poem as the alliterative Mort Arthur in order to distinguish it from another long poem from around the same time, dealing with similar source material. This work is known as the Stanzaic Mort Arthur, and while the two stories culminate in King Arthur's death, the alliterative version focuses on his war on the continent and return home to a shock betrayal, whereas the Stanzaic Arthur tells a different story of betrayal, the story of Lancelot and his affair with Guinevere. This storyline, told largely from Lancelot's perspective, is much more lurid and contains perhaps more recognisably Arthurian moments. However, the Stanzaic metre and rhyme scheme results in much more fussiness. They looked for Lancelot far and wide, but nothing did they hear. Lovely as wild rose blossoming, one day Queen Guinevere sat at supper with Sir Gawain, Beside her with, I swear, a Scottish knight she well esteemed, on the other side of her. It is telling that some of the most enjoyable verse is also its most alliterative. Then Gawain, up to every while, put armour on, took arms, and mounted on a battle horse well used to war's alarms. He leapt forth like a living coal before the barbican, and challenged any knight within to prove himself a man. <laughs> 
When it comes to descriptions of battle, the alliterative version wins hands down. Compare the following. Readily the ruthless men of the round table, struck with strong steel through chain mail, cut through corslets and crushed bright helmets, hacking down heathens and hewing necks asunder. That's from the alliterative version. Now here's a similar moment from the dainty and faintly ridiculous stanzaic. Many a spear was thrust and splintered, many a stern word spoken, many a sword was hacked and bent, many a helmet broken. I wanted to ask as well, Is at the time of writing, um, there's a there isn't a, a common tongue in um, England. That's correct. But quite soon there is, which I, I, I sort of link with Chaucer and it, and it getting a bit sort of the kind of prosy English vernacular emerging um, and taking off. Is, is there a link between that happening and a sort of fading away of alliterative verse or is, are the two things not linked? Yeah, they could, that could well be the case. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I don't really know, but I, I, it does seem coincidental, doesn't it, that uh, alliterative... I mean, alliterative verse, I think, moves northwards to Scotland as the Scottish dialect or, or Scottish... Yeah, uh, so Northumberland and Scotland, di- early Scottish dialect appear, mm. and it moves up there. And so uh, there's certainly more of it in a later period in the North Country uh, than in the South as things as things changed. In terms of your own translation, then what 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 kind of what, what do you have in front of you, and and do you do you try to avoid certain versions or or, or, or f- and focus on working from one, or is it better to have a good full sweep? Oh well, uh, okay. What do I, what did I use? I used my my starting manuscript was Edmund Brock's transcription uh, of the nineteenth century, which is the Early English Text Society. Uh, and these are what I tend to use for my work, although they are dated and things have moved on. So in the case of the Literature Mortal, that was my starting one. And then I had Larry Benson's uh, uh, King Arthur's Death, which is a sort of a, a, a more modern version of, uh, of Brock. And I also used um, uh, Krishna's uh, Illiterative Mortartha, um, uh, which is... As you get older in age, it's nice to have bigger text so you can read it more clearly. Um, so I had that, and then I use, and then so those are my three Middle English uh, transcript. So that all those are transcribed from the well, some at some point or other they come from the original manuscript in Lincoln Cathedral, uh, and then I used uh, Stone's uh, the Penguin edition. I also used Armitage's edition, um, the 2012. Uh, what I'm trying to do is to get some of that joy and flavour and spit that comes out of these original writers and put them in a, a modern day room of medieval knights and ladies mm. who, who want to just have a bit of fun, but where, where the language rolls in an almost Shakespearean way. And the, and the thing about these literature poets is, well, they're, they're ba- they're, their language is based on a smaller vocabulary than our own which means that each word carries so much more weight uh you know so uh, you know in robin hood stories in summer when the leaves were green you know one sound that's a very short sentence but straight away you're in you're in the season of summer but the leaves are really green mm. they're not just green but they're green and uh, you know all of a sudden you're in this very rich environment and so that's what i try to do in the, and with and with the words I choose to use, uh, particularly in the literature of Mort Arthur now and going in f- future works, is to use uh, a vocabulary which is etymologically consistent with the time. So I, I won't use a modern word if etymologically it doesn't fit in. I'll, I'll give myself a bit of leeway. Mm. Um, uh, so, for example, if there's something that was around in the 17th century, I think, Okay, I'll I'll push that in because it, it still gives a bit of a historic flavour. But if it's 19th century or modern, I'm not interested because it sort of takes you away from from where I want the story to, mm. to rest. And in so doing, it forces you to write the sentences in the way that the poet was writing. And the real thing, the challenge with this one I've done, uh, unlike the Gawain and the Green Knight, uh, I have chosen not to use apostrophes so in so doing, if there's an apostrophe, I have to rewrite the sentence so it still works um, oh. without an apostrophe. And I tell you what, 
that's very hard. <laughs> I, bet, I, I bet you have a whole new appreciation for the apostrophe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, what I'm working on at the moment, which I can't talk about, but it's uh, I, I curse myself for this rule because it spoils so much. But it forces you to write in this style, and it's 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 good. Yeah, uh, you mentioned the spit, and obviously, that, I think that's the, I mean the most immediately pleasurable thing about about this poem um I, the description of the giant as uh he's got the the, the collops of his face and his flounder mouth and fleering um oh yes a, and all of yes. the gore as well that yeah. livers exposed brains on lances dripping off and that kind of thing is there <laughs> something about alliterative verse do you think that lends itself to that sort of um oh without a doubt i mean you know you, you go along to any football match or whatever and you hear the abuse that's poured out at yeah uh, at, at some player or other or the referee and it's almost certainly the abuse will be partly alliterative yeah because you just it's the venom that you just want to get out of these people whatever's wrong in your own life you want to pass it to somebody else and uh and those poor referees and linesmen they're the ones that get it yeah. from the neck <laughs> From a load of modern day alliterative poets on the terraces um but i think it does it lends itself well to that but having said that you know you look at gawain and the green knight that's a much gentler poem mm. a much more nuanced poem and um that has a different form of uh, musicality to it the alliteration serves to create a a oh, uh, mellifluous flow really which is which, oh, I don't know, as you know it's, it's a beautiful piece of work mm. One thing the alliterative style proves deliciously successful at is lavish descriptions of food. And since we have something of a track record in slavering over extended menus from The Wind in the Willows, Jules Verne, and Boswell and Johnson's Scottish Adventures, I thought it would be remiss to leave out the following. These are merely some culinary highlights from the feast Arthur serves to his visiting Roman senator. Peacocks and plovers on platters of gold, porcupine piglets unpastured by man, herons handsomely hidden in their plumage, and swans swiftly served on silver chargers. Wild boar shoulders with the best brawn sliced, barnacle geese and bitterns on embossed dishes, young hawks on croute, and brisket of pork brightly gleaming. Next come cranes and curlews cunningly roasted, rabbits in rare sauce richly hued, pheasants flourished with flaming silver, and pies glazed with glare and good things in plenty. We, we touched on this, but I just I just wanted to um, ask as a follow up. So it's the alliterative verse is I, I as, as associate it with with Beowulf and the, the Anglo Saxons. Was was there um was there a particular reason for its its fourteenth century and um, well fifteenth century revival? Well, as I say, what I'm not what I'm not sure about is um, whether it ever went away. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's. It, it, it could have been spoken on. People could have been speaking it in courts. Uh, mm. I mean, you know, there's an argument that would say that the French language took over uh, when after the Norman conquest and maybe it was buried and way of speaking verse and the poetry was hidden uh, for a long while. And then possibly with the Black Death and the destruction of level, great swathes of society, uh, then the English language came back into greater use and with it, uh, the alliterative style. I mean, I think, you know, there, there, there are poems like uh, William of Palerne, for example, which were commissioned by a great uh, uh, aristocratic uh, French and Latin reading magnate, Humphrey of, uh, was it Humphrey de Bohun? Uh, and, uh, and yet he commissioned this, the translation of this French poem into a, the alliterative style. So, you know, he in English for his people in his Gloucestershire estates, and you think, uh, well, why has he done that? You know, so there mm. must be uh, there, was, there was clearly some kind of uh, undercurrent of poetic uh, tendency going on in the land, but I don't know. I I, I wouldn't I would never go so far as to say it was quashed, uh, and and it seems to me as a way of relating long stories. The alliterative style and its meter enable you to control pace and delivery and help mm. you to remember. I mean, I've done a few performances of Gawain and uh, and also the alliterative Mort Arthur. In a, I I I work for a, I, I, I do some voluntary work for a redundant church, and as a way of raising money, the last few years we've done 
performances based on bridge translations of my poems and the the, the wow. joy of doing them the, 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 this particular church is there's no electric light there's no heating and we usually do it in the middle of winter um so the steam rises from your mouth and the candle lights is all there is is candles in there it's pitch black mm. and there's about 200 people in there and you're just speaking this alliterative these alliterative words and uh, it just has a power all of its own and i'm not sure i mean maybe a, a more fluid and florid uh, poetic style would work just as well but certainly this helps you keep control of an audience in a cold environment so yeah i don't so what did it go away did it revive i i don't know uh, yeah. but that's fascinating though the the idea that well not the idea that the the proof that it it is that the style assists memory for recital um yeah. Oh, it does. It makes no, such but... sense as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It 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 really does. And uh, and you can and once you become in control of it, you can really. Uh, so just going back a bit, when you asked me about how I translate, now I read passages to myself aloud, and I read them again and again, and then all of a sudden, what it's saying to you is, "Oh no, she's saying that, or he's saying that," and it yeah. just comes out at you, you know. So um, it has. It's got that great ability to to work from a memory point of view. But yeah. I don't think anyone would have memorized the alliterative Mort Arthur, but you never know. You know <laughs> someone <laughs> good, will have. <laughs> good luck to them, that's all I can say. Yeah. <laughs> it's obvious as soon as you as you as you say it, because there's there's so many um I mean not really lists, but kind of catalogues of particularly in, I'm thinking in the battle scenes, there's so many uh you know items of warfare, descriptions of formations and names. Um, this, yes, yes, it's not just the sort of uh, gory side of things. It must also assist with that sort of um, sword rattling militaristic march. Yeah, I, I, in terms of the liter- in fact, the, the style of the literature of Arthur is very much uh, a martial style. It rattles yeah. along exactly as you say in a mil- in a militaristic way, um, and there are uh, things that come out of it that shorthand sections which are repeated throughout. Uh, there's a particular phrase, something like along the salt strands, uh, which comes out again and again. So you have these battle scenes and then at the end of a battle scene, it would say, and, uh, you know, and then they decamped along the salt strands. Um, and I, these remind me of the, the old hot letter days of the, of the press in Fleet Street, where, you know, you, people would reach up for a particular phrase rather than have to set it letter by letter. So, yeah. you know, uh, uh, actions incompatible with their status, uh, for example, <laughs> would, would be one or, uh, where an act of gross sexual indecency occurred, you know, the two men did this, the what so did that, you know, the, and so these poems read like that. They have bits that just are taken out and used again and again and again. Yeah. Um, I, I, to come back to the the poets, sort of, um, I read in your introduction to um, Gawain that the the narrator, whether it is the poet or not, literally meant to be the poet or is a, as another narrator, is this sort of mysterious figure who surfaces and adds a s- sort of dash of personality or personal opinion every now and again. And yes. there's a similar moment, I, I counted at least one moment where that happens in the illustrative Arthur. And um, I think he says, and now something happened which I found particularly annoying. And it suddenly makes you go, oh, <laughs> there's someone watching all of this <laughs> yes. is that yeah th- that is, is another thing that makes it seem uh very modern that it's not a kind of chorus voice um yeah it, yeah is, that's right that, is that normal for the for the period or is was... i think it's the ones that i've worked on yes uh uh and some of them are even more personal uh really? it's like they're, they're, they're with you the whole time um so but but that idea where he suddenly forgets that he's dispassionate, he suddenly appears in your head. I, I, I think that's quite charming. Who is he? I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. It's. Uh, but you're right. You're right to pick that up. It's. Uh, it's. It's quite. 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 Quite wonderful. It is. Yeah. You immediately sort of hope that he's some old veteran. You know, he was a spear carrier <laughs> or something, watching all this and dodging <laughs> and yeah, scribbling. That's it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a moot point whether this person this this writer i mean the detail the detail in this poem is so profound that it suggests either he had fought in battles or he knew many people who did or he was extremely well read yeah. I mean, the, 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 his knowledge is astonishing 
and some of the things he talks about like sea warfare and the way people uh, lower the lead at the luff for example i mean this is acutely observed uh, uh, activity uh, which you, know, you can imagine a poet a poet today or an artist picking up on some minor act like someone like Revilius, who is one of my favorite artists uh, he he has a great technique for picking up the unobserved mm. in life you know the, someone standing in the corner hoeing a hoeing a lawn or or a, or a cat attending to itself while some major piece of action is going on elsewhere and this is what this uh the arthur poet does he 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 takes the details of life and lays them out for us a bit like a, an illuminator in those illuminated manuscripts you know the uh tray richards the duke de berry uh the, the months of the year i mean you look at the illuminations there and the things he sees mm. these aren't decorations these are things he actually saw you know this is this is this is not art this is a photograph yeah. of another world and and that's what this poet is sh showing us and so did this poet for example travel that pilgrim's route all the way through the center of europe across the alps into northern italy down to rome on that journey that arthur took or had he read adam of usk who took a similar journey at around 1400 uh, you know you know so is it reading is it experience mm. uh Oh, and then his description of, at one point, he describes the archers of an army being arranged on the flanks. Uh, so it, in medieval warfare and English armies, typically the majority would be archers or longbowmen, and maybe 10, uh, maybe 20 percent of the army would be uh, knights who would typically fight dismounted. And it's always been a matter of debate as to where the archers were. So often you'll see them shown in spikes along the front of the army, and sometimes they're shown on the flanks. And in the alliterative Mort Arthur, it's quite clear. He says the archers form on the flanks mm. of this particular battle. Uh, so you know, that is an observation of seeing an English army in action somewhere. Yeah. Because uh, otherwise he would have just said, oh, the archers have just formed up. But no, he says they form up on the flanks. Yeah. So... Yeah, you know, that that is acute observation. Yeah, who who? Gosh, who'd have thought that it would be a, a, an Arthurian poem could contain so much documentary um, information it's full like of it. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, it is that absolutely. also seems to set it set it in stark contrast to to the likes of Mallory. Yeah, this is yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is not about this. In, almost the story is not really about people. It's about a time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it is about people. It's about Arthur and so on. But but it, but again, if we see if we see it as semi didactic and saying kings shouldn't behave like this, the people are almost secondary to what's being said. And I, I say in my introduction to the book, uh, which when you when it's published, you'll see. But it, I say this is a poem for the modern times. You know, we have these uh, populist politicians and nationalists saying, you know, the the past was a brilliant country. We're going to bring it back. And this is what Arthur does. And uh, he goes over there. And of course, once that bubble is burst, there's nowhere else to go. Mm. And, uh, you know, this this story is a story of the pricking of those bubbles. A contemporary of the Arthur poet whose name does survive is Lawrence Minot, who lived during the first half of the 14th century. Like the Arthur poet, he was a northerner who wrote in alliterative verse. His poems patriotically celebrated the triumphs of Edward III, during the Hundred Years' War. By contrast to Minot's celebratory war songs, critics have picked up on a much less flattering picture of crusade in the alliterative Arthur. According to W.R.J. Barron, the poem's thematic emphasis is on the fate of a society as conditioned by the character and personal conduct of the hero king. Here, the confluence of chivalric adventure and chronicle becomes sinister. The traditional beginning of a hero's adventure required the ritualistic donning of armour, whereas here, what we see is a whole nation arming itself for war. By the time of the poem's first appearance, the glory of Edward III's achievements in France would have lost a bit of their glow. The English people may well have realised that for years of crippling taxation, they had made very little meaningful gain. Once they heard the returning soldiers' stories of raping and pillaging across France, they could be forgiven for suspecting the repeated outbreaks of plague had a ring of divine retribution. In short, there would be ample reason to feel disillusioned with the cant of religious crusade, the sort Arthur delivers before his invasion. My ancestors were emperors who owned Rome themselves, 
They occupied the empire for eight score winters, each heir in turn, so the old men say. Then Constantine, our kinsman, captured it after that. He was heir to England's throne and emperor of Rome, and captured the cross by conquest of arms, one which Christ was crucified, king of heaven. So we asked the emperor with equal justice, what right thus to rule in Rome does he claim? Edward III, the man who rebuilt Arthur's round table, began the Hundred Years' War when he made his own claim to the French crown. For Edward, the issue of divine right provided a perfect excuse for economic and territorial gain. Arthur's dispute leads him to Rome, which Marco Nievergelt calls a conveniently slippery double signifier that acts both as metaphorical centre of imperial ambitions and as a sacred pilgrimage destination.